Welcome to the 2013 Sedation Peer-to-Peer Podcast. This educational activity is sponsored by the France Foundation and is supported by an educational grant from Huspira. Today's discussion is presented by Dr. Riker and Ms. Klein. Let's listen in. Hi, my name is Dr. Rich Riker. I'm a critical care intensivist and neurointensivist at Maine Medical Center in Portland, Maine. And it's a pleasure to join you today to talk about this important area of patient care in intensive care units, the, the issue of pain. I think what I want to start off with is to say that pain is an ongoing problem for us as clinicians and that it's a difficult thing to assess and it's an often ignored part of sedation and patient comfort. Uh, There's so much data now that tells us that when you look at patients who have survived being in the intensive care unit and ask them what they remember, for many of them, pain is one of those things. Despite our efforts to keep them comfortable, they remember having pain, being uncomfortable, having dyspnea. And Kate, I don't know if if you see a a similar problem in in your ICU as well. We do, and I'll introduce myself. My name is Kate Klein. I'm an acute care nurse practitioner at Cleveland Clinic in their neurological intensive care unit in Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, we do see it. I'm finding that practicing in a a neurological intensive care unit, that poses some unique challenges because a lot of our patients are, they're they're cognitively impaired, very difficult for us to determine or for them actually to tell us whether they're in pain or not. There's many neurological symptoms that go on with their neurologic injury that make it very, very difficult to to assess whether they have pain or not. And as they they do recover somewhat, it gets a little bit easier, but yeah, it's, it's a difficult symptom to to work through. Kate, do you see issues or challenges in trying to grasp the concept of what pain is to patients? I know that, you know, as a physician, we tended early on at least to limit our consideration of pain to patients who had trauma or just had surgery. And there was a fair amount of publication information suggesting that medical patients really didn't have pain in the ICU. They had no reason to have pain. And yet I think now there's been a lot of information to to change that concept for us. Things like, uh, I know if I have to sit in a lecture for more than about 30 minutes, I start having pain in my butt. And I, I can't imagine what it must be like for these patients to lay in bed for days and days and not be getting up and not be moving and and just that by itself, you know, forget the the tubes that are in various places and the turning and all of those kinds of things. Um, What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I do. I have read some papers that do talk about the, both they compare medical medical ICU along with the surgical trauma. And yeah, they both have experienced pain. And I think for our patients in the, in the neurological ICU, there's often this feeling that they can't get out of bed because, you know, they have ICP monitors or, you know, they're on the ventilator. So they have all this stuff that's hooked up to them. So there's a, re- a bit of a reluctance to get them out of bed and mobilize and such. So sure, when patients are there for a good long time, find that they do have a lot of the joint pain and, and muscle pain as we try to and we, we see them grimace and such. So I think we see a lot of that, a lot of that as well, that there's those patients who are in bed for, for a long time, they have those same same kind of symptoms and same level of pain and such that a medical ICU or a surgical trauma ICU patient would have. It's always been very interesting and eye-opening to me to read self-reports from nurses and doctors who end up in an intensive care unit and they talk about what their experience was like. And it's always, I think, a very eye-opening thing to understand from from an experienced clinician's perspective what it's like to be on that other side. And I, I think I've had a little bit of that as well. When I was an emergency medicine resident, I fell on my bicycle and, and got a pretty big road rash. And I'd cared for 
lots and lots of patients in the emergency department who had had that, you know, came in with those kinds of injuries, but to actually experience myself and understand what it's like to try to put a dressing on and clean it and, and feel that, I gained a whole amount of respect for, you know, what these patients are going through. And then a couple of years ago, I, I had a water skiing injury and ended up rupturing a muscle and had a lot of edema in my leg. And understanding that edema in a leg is tender, I, I had never even mm-hmm. considered that that was the case. I used to just squeeze legs, and you know these patients who had horrible pitting edema, never anticipating that I was causing them pain. So I think we probably tend to underestimate what that pain is, who has it, and when it's present. Right, and I think for you know patients with neurologic injury, I think they have a lot of those same uh, feelings of pain from immobility, edema, and then just some of the invasive lines, whether it be a central line or the endotracheal too. But for patients with neurologic injury, there's also more intense level of pain, and the effect on the quality of recovery is more profound than previously understood for those patients who have neurosur- you know, surgical interventions to their cranium or they have an ICP monitor, the periosteum and the dura are very sensitive to noxious stimuli. So that's something for us to take into consideration as patients come in and they're already cognitively impaired and that they can't. And it may not be because of sedation. It might just be because of their neurologic injury that they're not able to communicate about pain. And then they have this kind of procedure where they, they're rushed in and they're, an ICP monitor is put in. I think it's really important and we're getting much better about assessing for pain either just prior to an intervention like that or or procedure like that and then you know enduring and even after and then I see the nurses really checking in with the patients even after and trying to find those signs of pain whether it be just asking them and getting some sign of whether they're in pain or going through the type of pain assessment that we use. You know, I think one of the things that that was also eye-opening to me is understanding what the consequences of untreated pain Mm. are for patients in the ICU. You know, I used to think it was just they were uncomfortable for a while and then got better and they felt better and there wasn't a big deal. But now to see some of the epidemiologic studies that have suggested that patients who tend to have the least adequate pain control are the ones where it has a lot of downstream consequences with delayed healing and Mm -hmm. limited functional capacity, you know, the problems with poor sleep and, you know, whether that's uh, related to increases in delirium, I think is a little bit of a controversy. But nonetheless, I, I think we all know how we feel if we haven't slept well the night before. And to think that patients may have days on end with inadequately treated pain, poor sleep, and and then we're asking them to try to heal and get better and take part in therapies. And, That's uh, right, yeah. yeah. It can be a real challenge, I think. Mm-hmm. I think with the, those, I think overall ubiquitous is the suppression of healing, it, it, even just impeding mobility. We're doing a mobility study now that we're trying to get patients out of bed. And, and the protocol initially did not even have pain as assessing pain. So we've you know, quickly changed, recognized that and put that in as, you know, we're not going to be able to mobilize our patients as, as well as we possibly can or the patient won't be able to mobilize as well as they can if their pain is adequately managed. But yeah, the interruption of sleep, but then there's also the emotionally taxing part of experiencing pain. And that's not well understood or hasn't well been investigated much in, for patients with neurologic injury. But some of the physiologic things that responses to that stress of pain uh, that we have to take into consideration are things like the catabolic hypermetabolism that increases brain metabolism and then that just uses up oxygen and then you end up with a um, hypoxemic effect in the brain and then also things like increasing intracranial pressure. So it's amazing when a patient comes in and their intracranial pressure, put a monitor in and we see that their intracranial pressure or ICP is up in the you know, 25 or 30 and then just that in itself, we wonder, it, we ask ourselves, boy, is this what kind of pain is this patient having? And then giving them an analgesic and just watching that intracranial pressure come right down. And then we have to just take into consideration that there's reduced cerebral venous outflow too. That, and then you get that vicious cycle. If there's not good cerebral venous outflow, then your ICPs will continue to rise. 
So those are the couple of the considerations that we have in our unit. We're looking at now more assessing patients long term, you know, three months, six months out to look at the psychological impact of their time in the ICU and with pain and one pain particularly. And one of the things that we're trying to capture with our early mobility study and trying to mobilize patients, we're finding that pain comes up when patients talk about what was frustrating or was difficult or a more traumatic experience. It's the feeling the pain when they started to recover. Um, those are We really have to take into consideration some of the physiologic things in the short term that go on when a patient's acute, unstable stage. And then as they begin to recover and we're trying to mobilize them again, pain is something that we need to look at closely from the moment they come into the ICU to as they recover. That's an interesting story. I'd be interested in, in what your perspective is in the challenges that we face in trying to get doctors and nurses and other clinicians as well, physical therapists and others, to assess pain, some of the challenges trying to implement that program. You mentioned that you just did it when you were looking at your mobility study. Can you talk at all about what some of those challenges are? In terms of assessing for pain? Yeah, or or implementing a protocol that requests assessment of pain. I think with one of the challenges that we always have is maintaining a patient's, trying to keep them as clear as possible, not in terms of their neurological exam. And this goes from the beginning of when they come in right through to recovery. And for us in our unit, it's pain is, we struggle between trying to maintain a good neurological exam, a clear one that says whether a patient is improving or if there's some sort of secondary injury going on that we need to, and we try very hard not to mask that. So trying to balance that out with adequately managing the patient's pain, but also watching them closely to catch a secondary neurologic injury or an extension of their their injury that's going on. So that goes right through from when they come in, right through their recovery. And that's a multidisciplinary approach to managing the pain. For the nurses, they're constantly assessing for that pain. They see it, whereas, you know, maybe the the neurosurgeons come in and they want to see their assessment for how are they doing, how are they progressing or not with their recovery of their, their neurologic injury. And then even with mobilizing patients, as I spoke about, it's trying to get everybody to really not just to go in and and start mobilizing them, but to really pay attention to are they in pain and what can we do to optimize that as we progress them through mobilization, the first thing that we do is look at the level of pain that they have. And that's and so it's always challenging with our patients to be able to manage their pain and give them some sort of narcotic because it seems to have a pretty decent impact on their cognition as well. They're already impaired, so giving them some Percocet or a little bit of fentanyl or what have you to to try and ameliorate that pain can also impact their ability to then function or be able to progress. So it's a challenge because you want to mobilize them. They can't mobilize very well if they're in pain, but then if you're trying to manage the pain, it impacts them further in their neurologic function. You know, it reminds me when you were talking about prophylaxing for mobility and doing those kinds of things regarding pain, how big an impact the AACN Thunder 2 project had on my perception of pain. And for those of you that don't know that study, it was published by Kathleen Pantillo way back in 2004. But they looked at, I think, more than 6,000 patients in the ICU and asked those patients to rate the severity of pain of six common procedures in the ICU. And you tend to think of procedures in the ICU as sticking needles or chest tubes or pulling out drains or doing those kinds of things. But they also included some routine care procedures like turning in bed and suctioning endotracheal tubes. And it was amazing to me that the most severely ranked painful procedure was turning. Yes. And that's something I never considered. I thought, yeah, you know, flip them around in bed, they're laying there. How how painful can that be? Patients rated turning in bed as the most painful mm-hmm. procedure. Yeah, that is, when you think of a procedure, it, reading some of the papers out there on, you know, the difference between just a patient at rest, even going through all of this, there are 
when a patient is at rest, I think we look at them and say, oh, great, we're not turning them, they're sleeping, or they're, they might be a little bit sedated, so they're not in any pain. And I think we have to, part of making sure that somebody's not in pain is to recognize that pain does exist, even at rest. So if they're at pain at rest, then when a nurse goes in to turn them, and knowing that now that turning has been identified as one of the most painful interventions, care interventions. It just, I think having a recognition of that patient might be in pain just at rest, and then we go in and do an assessment of their pain and, and trying to turn them. I think that's one of the one of the strategies, too, of, of assessing pain is to recognize first that a patient can be in pain at rest. Yeah, I think that's great, and it, it kind of leads us into the issues of assessment of pain. Mm-hmm. And clearly, for us to be able to reduce the pain the patient's having and, and understand that you know, they are having pain, we need to have mm-hmm. some tools to assess that. This concludes the discussion. We would like to thank Dr. Riker and Ms. Klein for their contributions and continued support. Thank you for listening. To receive credit, please complete the evaluation form found on the website www.sedation-cme.org.